Good morning, everyone. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. Thank you for allowing us this time in your word. Thank you for teaching us and showing us and opening our eyes to the things which the Spirit is saying to us at this time. Now give us an ear to hear and a mind to obey. And bless us. Bless this church and every church open in your name. And we pray for every church service starting right here in the park and every church open. Bless and keep us now. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you and good morning. Uh, I'm going to have to use this one. We're going to rebrand these lessons from what Christians believe to back to basics too, because as you all have noticed, I'm not staying with the book. Is that all right? I'm not staying with the book. And uh, I'm going to get back on the outline, but I am not going to stay with the book next week either. So uh, I haven't been in the building long enough. My tablet's not picking up the Wi-Fi. But I want to start from this point from last week by way of quick review. I think it'll open now. Nope, it's not. That's okay. But as you remember, we've been talking about the creation and in dealing with when God created man, when he breathed into our, uh, Adam's nostrils, he created man and man became a living soul. And this is the major difference between man, animal, fish, uh, bird, all other creatures. Now, in Acts 17 and 28, we are the direct offspring of God, children of God by creation. All mankind are children of God by creation. Acts 17 and 28, for in him we live, move, and have our being. As also some of our, your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So every creature belongs to God. Every, crea every human being belongs to God. And as a result, there is a dignity that belongs to mankind. Regardless of race, regardless of culture, even regardless of their spiritual life at the time, we all belong to him as children. And there's a dignity, uh, there's a way we need to treat one another, regardless of race, creed, color, or anything else. You don't have to always, uh, I, I put it like this, folk don't always have to look like us for us to get along with them. Am I right? Because think about it like this. We all intend and we all know that we're going to heaven. And when we get there, there's going to be a whole lot of folk we've never seen. And a whole lot of folk that are not going to look like us and didn't come up the way we did. So we have to get along there, right? And it's going to be easy there. Why not do it right, right here? Amen? Amen. So let me move forward, though. So our souls and spirits are eternal, and they're the non-physical part of our being. They're the non-physical part of our being. Our soul is how we connect with each other and the world around us. Our thoughts, our emotion, our intellect, decisions, motivations, behaviors, and so on. Because it is our souls that make decisions. The Bible speaks of it as our heart or even our mind. But we make decisions in that soul realm. Are y'all still with me? And we're told, in, for example, in Deuteronomy 6 and 5, love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then we can even long for God from within. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Amen. When can I go and meet with God? Although mankind has fallen from our first estate because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we are told that we are still triune beings. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the God of peace himself will sanctify you holy and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The angels of God are only called spirits. In Hebrews, the first chapter, 7th and the 14th verse, they're only referred to as spirits and not souls. So we are created a little lower than the angels in that there are things that we cannot do right now. But God has for our eternal destiny an eternal physical body. Amen? And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? So, and we've also shared that, you know, while the body, soul, and spirit are together, we are considered alive. And then death becomes when the spirit and soul separate from the body. Now, our souls, which make up our identities and personalities, Go to be with God. Now, I share this scripture every time I commit a body to the ground of a Christian. In 1 Thessalonians, 13th and 14th verses from the Amplified. Now, we do not want you to be uninformed, believers, about those who are asleep in death. Now, in the Bible, because of our relationship with God, when a saint dies, they call it falling asleep. Now, it does not refer to soul sleep. It does not mean that a person is sleeping in the ground in the grave. It means that physical body is resting. Yes, it is in the ground. But this, uh, remember that absent from the body means present with the Lord, right? Right? So if we're present with the Lord, we're wide awake. And we know what's going on. Am I right? So the Bible often refers to it, the writers often refers to it as asleep. So he says about those who are asleep in death, so that you will not grieve for them as others who have no hope beyond this present life. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as in fact he did, even so, God, in this same way, by raising them from the dead, will bring with him those believers who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So when Christ returns to this earth, when the rapture takes place, he brings with him the souls of all who have transitioned. All of those who have fallen asleep, all of those who are no longer alive in this world, he brings those souls with him. Y'all still with me? So they are gathered with him now, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And when he returns, they will rise first. He brings their souls with him. The bodies will be instantaneously reconstituted into glorified bodies, perfect bodies, eternal bodies, healthy bodies, nothing at all uh, uh, reminding of what took us out when we were alive. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Now I'm going to talk about that in the subsequent uh, lessons. 
But let me get back to the outline because I want to finish chapter 3. Take a look, if you will. Those of you keeping up with me. Hebrews. Fourth chapter, 12th verse. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, what it's saying here is, again, how soul and spirit are joined together. But the word of God is so sharp that it could even separate soul from spirit. Y'all with me? Then when you look at Psalm, the eighth uh, division, verses four through six, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. We're going to deal next with mankind's free will. Genesis, the second chapter, 15th through 17th verse. This is where God puts man in the garden and says, listen, you can eat of every tree but that one. Every other tree is good. Don't eat this one here. Man's free will is what brought about the fall. Y'all see that? The Lord God commanded man, eat anything you want. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter and the 19th verse, Moses is talking in his benedictory sermon to the children of Israel. And he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. We're in a place where life has choices and choices have consequences. Now, in this day and age, people don't believe in consequences. I do what I want, get away with it. Nobody's going to, you know, you don't have the right to even tell me I did wrong. But that's not the way it works out. And God says, I'm giving you the choice. I'm giving you the free will. Let me stop for just a moment. Why would God give us free will? Why not make us want to behave? Hmm? And those of us who are parents, wouldn't it have been easier if our children, we could press a button and they suddenly behaved? Stop tearing up the house. Stop coming in late. Stop leaving dishes all over the sink, not even loading up the dishwasher. When I was growing up, I was the dishwasher. And here all you have to do is put it in a machine and leave it until there's enough to run it and the sink's still piled high. Wouldn't it be nice to just press the button and all of that's over? This is why God wants people who will love him voluntarily. He wants people who want to be with him. He wants people who want him as much as he wants us. If you've ever been in a love affair that they call unrequited, unrequited love, where you loved and they didn't love you back, that's miserable. Have you ever had a so-called friendship where you were the friend and they just took, 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 take, take, take every chance they got and they just took from you and then you're like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Well, God doesn't want anything forced. He wants us to love him, not just act like we love him. That's why it's so important, even in worship, that we give God the praise voluntarily. Nobody should have to force us or press us. Get up, y'all. 
Wave your hands. Now clap. Now put your hands up in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. He wants us to love him voluntarily and freely. He wants heaven to be filled with those who really want to be there. And if we really want to be there, first thing, believe that Jesus is the Christ and that God has raised him from the dead. And that's where our salvation comes from. Y'all still with me? And so he says, I'm giving you a choice in Deuteronomy 30. I'm giving you that choice. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. He even tells us what to do. Choose life that not only you, but your children may live. B, Joshua 24 and 15. Joshua is at the end of his career. And he's telling the people of Israel, because he knows that they've been slipping and falling off and on throughout their 40 years. That's how they ended up spending 40 years in the wilderness. He says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve God? Or are you going to serve the idol gods that your father served on the other side of the river? Or the gods, and these again are idols, of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Are you going to go along with the crowd or are you going to serve God? He says, make a choice. Look at somebody tell them, make a choice. Now tell somebody else, I made my choice. Now give God a praise for the choice that you made in Jesus Christ. Because Joshua goes on to say, and if it seems evil, if you just can't get with serving the Lord, choose who you're going to serve. Choose this day. But listen, as for me and my house, whatever y'all do, whatever they do cross town, whatever they do here and there, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's free will. I'm going to stray a little bit off the reservation again. Proverbs 16 and 9. We can make our plans, but God orders our steps. A man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And then finally, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, and this is again, free will choice, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and then there's one more, Revelations 3 and 20, where Jesus himself tells us, I stand at the door and knock. He's right there. He's saying, let me in. I want to fellowship. I want to save you. I want to help you. I am God, but I love you. He says in Revelation 3 and 20, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, dine with him, and he with me. Now, man's future, this is wrapping up this outline. In man's future, let me scroll down to that. Again, and this is very important because we have, as a part of our free will, the right to make the right choice and the need to be careful of the choices made. Don't ignore. Don't bypass God's calling and God's mercy. Now, one of the things, and I'm just going to preface where I'm going, one of the things that I've heard over and over, and I'm sure you have too, people who criticize grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's loving us 
even though we don't deserve it. God being good to us. God giving us days and months and years when we didn't do right. There are people out there right now that don't love God, don't love themselves, don't love nobody. And some folk would say, well, Lord, why don't you just take them out? Grace. The same grace that he has loved us with is the grace that he's applying to the lives of others. Amen? And when you have that kind of grace, and when you have that kind of love, it seems open-ended. I was sharing with somebody, I forget who I was talking to, um, when I first started pastoring here, this church had such a strict dress code. You're going to hell if you're wearing pants. Now, granted, the slacks my wife had would never fit me, and they weren't made for me, and vice versa. And that was well before the time where you had all this cross-dressing and trans stuff going on. Now, that is what Deuteronomy is talking about. Men putting on women's clothes, women putting on men's clothes, and then the mindset that comes with that, acting mannish for the sisters. Oh, y'all got quiet. And acting feminine for the brothers. That's what it's talking about. But we had such a strict dress code. Uh, choir members couldn't wear uh, certain jewelry. Y'all remember that? Had to pull your jewelry off. Go up there ball faced it. They were moving towards certain things about makeup and stockings and all the other things. And men, we had to wear a tie. And you could not ever, ever have an interesting haircut. I ran into a brother not that long ago who uh, he's going to church now and he, he even comes here. But he left here because of the hubbub about his haircut. And he said to me, Pastor, I never understood. I was a teenager, and my hair was going to grow out. And look, my hair, in fact, he's bald as I am now. But understand that there was such rigor there. And when I changed it, uh, I got hit bunch of times, but that's what pastors do, especially when you know what you're doing is right. Because I said to a pastor friend of mine, we're doing come as you are. Y'all remember when we started come as you are? And see, that's the way it is now. You wear what you want to wear, and all y'all look good every Sunday. But come as you are. And he said, well, Reverend, you realize that uh, you do come as you are. And somebody might come in there in hot pants. And this is before we got to streaming like we do now. And I said, well, Reverend, if they come in in hot pants, they in the church. And they get in the word. And if the word takes root, they're going to come out of them hot pants. And there was a young lady. And I pray her and her daughter are well. They came and they sat on that front row right there. And she had on hot pants because it was in the middle of July. And you know, the air in this building has struggled for years. But <laughs> she had on hot pants. A couple Sundays later, she came in in kulaks. She came out of them hot pants. Now, y'all ain't got to say, man, I know what I'm here to do. Because we have all these rules and all this stuff that's man-made. And I go there for one hot second. When we were raising money, it didn't wear, matter what folk was wearing. Because one lady came in in a red leather pantsuit. And the pastor was, I wasn't pastor then, the pastor was sitting right there and she walked up and put her check in and everybody was happy. 
So if we, if Sunday morning is the most evangelistic time of the week, why are we pushing folks out? Y'all with me? So when you have grace, there's a mindset about abusing that grace. But turn with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And this is where I probably end it. 14th through 28th verses. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And I want you to think as we're reading Mount Sinai versus Mount Zion. All right. Hebrews, 12th chapter, 14th verse. Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life. In the King James it says follow peace with all men. Follow peace with everybody. And holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. And I broke it down to the New Living Translation so we could understand it quicker. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. All right. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. We're supposed to pray for each other, encourage each other, put up with each other, love each other, so that we don't miss God's grace. If we are going to get God's unmerited favor, we got to share God's unmerited favor with each other. Am I right? How many of you, there's just some days you wake up or you're going about your day and you remember how some folk did you wrong? Huh? That's easy to do. I had one that hit me early this morning. And I had to forgive all over again. Because that is God's favor to me. And if I can't show forgiveness, how can God forgive me? Didn't Jesus say, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us? Y'all, and then Jesus also said, if you can't forgive other folk, your father can't forgive you. So follow peace. Work at living in peace with everybody. You don't have to agree with them. You don't even have to like them. But you better love them. Some of y'all, that'll hit you next week. You don't have to get along. You don't have to agree. But live peacefully. Amen. Look after each other. And then when you... Forgive when you share that grace. He says in the next phrase of that verse, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. And it corrupts many. Now, I ain't going to ask because I don't want you to, to, to put yourself out there. But if we're not careful, all of us, got some stuff we can be better about. Am I right? All of us got some stuff that we can be better. Be, we can be angry. We can be hurt. We can be mad and justifiably. But what does it say? Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness. Bitterness is not just something that exists. It grows like a, a weed. And those of us that do any gardening or landscaping, there's some weeds and I go out there, I have to put on gloves because they got nettles on them. And those dandelion weeds. And when I pull it, that weed sometimes has got a root that long. It's got more underground than it had on top. And roots will grow in concrete. And if, for example, if this building were abandoned and there were vines growing into this wall it would literally destroy the mortar that's holding the wall together and the bitterness if we let it grow that root 
will destroy our souls and destroy our relationship not only with each other but most of all with God. Are y'all listening to me? We have to destroy the bitterness. Look at somebody and tell them, don't get corrupted. Because when you're around bitter folk, they'll feed your bitterness. There are just some folk, I love them, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them. I'm not going to talk to them longer than I have to. I'm not talking about members. Amen. I'm not talking about the membership because this is a good membership, even though we all got our stuff. I'm talking about folk out there, uh, uh, pastors, preachers. Uh, uh, there are some preachers call their members the N-word. Jesus didn't die for N-words. He died for us. Am I right? But there's that bitterness. They've been hurt. They've been wounded. They've been scarred. Guess what? I've been hurt. Wounded. Almost crushed. Right here. But I learned how to shake it off. Look and tell somebody, you better shake it off. Tell them, shake it off. Shake it off. Because if we get corrupted, we'll miss God's grace amen I got to move on because of the time verse 16 make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau Esau was the oldest of the two twins Esau and Jacob born to Isaac and Rebekah his younger brother was Jacob known as Israel who wrestled with God and God changed his nature Esau, however, lived only for what made him feel good, and he traded his birthright as firstborn son for a single meal for a bowl of beans. How many of you would trade your relationship with God for some black-eyed peas? <laughs> Even with a big slab of fat back in it, it ain't worth it. Talk to me, somebody. And then verse 17, you know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessings, his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. Now, we have to be careful not to throw away what God has given us. Don't throw away your relationship with God. For anything. Did y'all get that? There's a lot of stuff I can name. I don't have time. But we have to be careful not to spurn, not to treat with contempt the grace of God. That's like um, us married men saying, I'm going to cheat on my wife because this woman over here looks so good. And even though it might be a pleasant couple of hours, it ain't worth the hell. It ain't worth it. Look at tell somebody, it's not worth it. David sinned with Bathsheba. He was a man after God's own heart. He was called by God, loved by God, led by God. But he saw Bathsheba and said, I got to have her, took her, cheated on her husband, murdered her husband. The baby that she conceived with David died. And the rest of David's life even though he's loved by God and everybody uh, 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 in the Bible, those who, they're, they're, they're from the seed of David. But David's life was hell. Had a son that raped his, raped his uh, David's son raped David's daughter. Absalom and Tamar. No, I'm sorry, Ammon and Tamar. And then Absalom killed Ammon. These are all David's children. Then Absalom came after David. David's an old man now. Now he died at 70. 
So he was possibly somewhere around between 60 and 65 or 68 when this happened. An old man got to leave his house, leave his capital, run from his son because his son wanted to kill him. All of this because David went after a quick thing. Y'all know I, I, I fixed that up real quick. I, I fixed that up. Holy Ghost put the brakes on and said, say it this way. All because David wanted what he wanted and he threw away the peace that God had given him for a mess of beans. And that's not being derogatory to, to Bathsheba. So verse 18, I'm going to get as far as I can and we're going to stop. You have not come to a physical mountain. This is talking about Mount Sinai. To a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he told Moses, bring them to Mount Sinai and I will give you my law. Verse 19, for they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. You couldn't approach the mountain. It was fenced off. You had to keep your distance. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight, he said, I am terrified and trembling. Listen to this. We, he's talking to us, the writer of Hebrews is talking to us, verse 22. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. Stop there a moment. Look and tell somebody, my name is written in heaven did you know that did you know that I found out there are a whole bunch of John Belsers all over the country and there's a lot in South Carolina a lot in Tennessee and whatever but listen my name however God has chosen to identify me is also written in heaven and when he calls it I'm the only one that can answer same thing for each one of us in here he, he says, let's, let's keep going. Uh, you have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who is the judge over all things. At Mount Sinai, he kept himself separate. Now we come to him directly. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. The saints that have passed on and are in his presence, they're perfect. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, and made perfect. All the stuff we wrestle with here is over. Verse 24, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new custom, uh, covenant. I'm going to talk about that in the message today. Between God and people and to the sprinkled blood the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like Abel's blood did in Genesis when Cain killed him. So verse 25, be careful. Look and tell somebody, be careful. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who's speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. We're talking about the Holy Ghost. We're talking about God speaking directly to us through his spirit. So he says, don't refuse to listen. Don't throw away your grace. Tell somebody, don't throw away your grace. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. 
This means that all creation, everything, will be shaken and removed so only unshakable things will remain. What's unshakable? Those things we can't see. And if you look around, everything, everywhere is being shook. The world is shook up. Government shook up. Springfield shook up. Washington shook up. Chicago shook up. New York shook everywhere. Everything we thought was solid, even before the pandemic, has been shook up. And God is saying, don't ignore me. Because I'm going to shake things so that only those that have listened to me will remain. Verse 28 says we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. When we talk about holy fear, it's reverence, it's respect, it's the ability to do and want to do what God wants us to do. Amen? Last verse and I'm done because I'm way over. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, this is when Jesus tells us when he returns, he's going to divide his sheep from the goats. He's going to set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And he says, the king, I'm skipping to verse 34. The king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. Then the righteous would say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty, give you the drink? When did you see you a, did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the father will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. That goes right back. To where we're told in Hebrews to look out for each other. Y'all got that? 12 and 15, look after each other. That comes to what we as Christians, not I was in church every Sunday, Lord. Or I, I, I did this and I did that and I was religious and I was holy. Uh, uh, but you couldn't stand nobody but yourself. No, he says, if you put that love in action, I got you. Amen. I'm going to stop it right there. The rest of these scriptures you can read for yourselves, but I do want to end on Romans 14 because Romans 14 and 10, Romans 14 and 10, this goes right back in with how we need to care for each other. He says, but why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. Then each one of us give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us not judge anyone anymore. Stop looking at somebody else's situation. Thank God that he took care of your situation. Or just ask him to take care of your situation. And do I have a witness? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Let's not judge one another anymore. Because church folk are good at that. Oh, I wish I had time. I, we, we start service in 12 minutes. I wish I had time. Church folk judging. One thing. And, and, and I'm very careful as a pastor, as a preacher and a teacher of God's word. I rarely say anything about somebody's going to hell. Am I right? Y'all been with me 21 years? I rarely do that because hell is awful. It was so bad that Jesus died to keep us from going there. So stop judging folks. Resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in somebody else's way. 
And I'm going to leave you with this old song. I hear it every so often, but if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living is not in vain, and then my Christianity is not in vain. Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. Thank you for this time in your word. Be with us now and let your word change us and transform us from the inside out. Have your way now, Lord, and be pleased with all things related to each and every one of us. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for their faithfulness, Lord. Now, keep us, provide and protect, and then bless the service coming up, Father God, that souls are saved, healed, and delivered. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. See you in a few minutes.